Welcome back, everybody. Professional wrestler, comic book collector, video game enthusiast, Zach the Ripper Comics here. And I want to welcome you back to the second episode in our Let's Read series. Now, last time we did Wizard Magazine from October of 1992. This time we are moving ahead a few years to 1998. We are going to be covering the 10th anniversary of Nintendo Power. And what better cover to showcase on Zack the Ripper Comics than that of WWF stars Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Undertaker as we take a special look at WWF Warzone. Now Nintendo Power started in 1988 and ran until 2012. It started in 1988 as a spin-off of the Nintendo Fun Club newsletter which was coming out to people who had purchased the Nintendo Entertainment System and certain Nintendo first party video games. They would get this for free and in the final issue it said that we are going to be discontinuing the Nintendo Club newsletter and replacing it with Nintendo Power. Now, everybody that was subscribed to the newsletter got the first issue of Nintendo Power for absolutely free. And at that point, for the next couple years, it ran every other month. You would get a Nintendo Power one month, and then next they would actually send out strategy guides every other month. These are like $20 values that Nintendo was giving people absolutely free. Now, in 2012, it ceased because every magazine around that time period was just going by the wayside as the internet had really come up and taken a lot of the share and people were doing their writing and reading via online sources. As of 2017, Nintendo Power has returned as a kind of quiet, official Nintendo podcast. I still recommend checking it out if you haven't already and if you're at all nostalgic for something like Nintendo Power Magazine, which as you can see, we do keep in the bag and board here at Zack the Ripper Comics to keep it nice and safe and secure. So without further ado, let's get into our Let's Read of Nintendo Power from July of 1998, the 10th anniversary issue, issue number 110. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into it. It is Nintendo Power, issue number 110. You probably can't see that down here. I'll try to zoom in from July of 1998. Had a cover price of $4.95. That equivalates to about 7 to $8 now. This down here, the end is near, renew inside. This was actually printed on the cover. There's nothing to pull. It's not a sticker. They actually printed this on the cover for people that had subscriptions that were coming up sometime soon. Uh, Nintendo Power's 10th anniversary, as we said earlier. Again, the cover story is WWF Warzone. Power goes over the edge. The WWF was out of control. This was considered the Attitude Era, the Boom Era, when it was had reached its biggest peak of all time. And that biggest star of that time period was this man right here, Stone Cold Steve Austin. As you can see, he's fighting The Undertaker, who just last year retired, where Stone Cold Steve Austin retired in 2003 and has been doing a barrage of things ever since, including podcasting and television shows. Up here, you can see that we'll be covering, be covering Mission Impossible, Nintendo 64 Undercover, in an N64 preview, they have F-Zero-X coming soon, going fast. Over here, under the main story of WWF, we have Power Strategies for Mortal Kombat 4, Quest 64, and Banjo-Kazooie Part 2. I'm assuming in the previous issue, they had looked at Part 1. Now, I do want to let everybody know that this is a blind read-through for me. I purchased this years ago, obviously, 1998, and I have not looked at this probably in the last 20-some years. So we're going to be doing a blind read-through of this. I feel that that's more exciting for the Let's Reads, so I can show excitement, and in turn, hopefully you get some kind of excitement, or at least some nostalgia from these reads. So first things first, we open up. There's an ad over here on the right. I'm assuming 
yeah, it's part of it. This is all Star Fox 64. It looks to be the strategy guide for it. If you renew now, you renew the Nintendo Power Magazine. If you renew now, you get the free strategy guide. That's actually an incredibly good deal. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure I renewed. Over here you can see, let's look at the prices. So renew my subscription and send me the free player's guide of my choice. You could get Star Fox 64, GoldenEye 007, and Banjo-Kazooie. GoldenEye 007, absolutely the top third, top three game on the Nintendo 64, along with Ocarina of Time and Super Mario 64. Uh, 36 issues would cost $49.95, 24 issues for $36.95, and 12 issues for... <coughs> 1995. Either you're in or you're out. Uh. And the reason we have our Nintendo 64 controller joining us, and this is my original Nintendo 64 controller from Christmas 1997, is because the majority of Nintendo Power in July of 1998 is going to focus on the Nintendo 64. You see the logo up here, you see it over here. You see it on all of the titles. Well, not all of them, but you know what I mean. Nintendo 64 was crazy hot in July of 98, and Game Boy Color will probably be colored in here also as it was getting ready or had just gotten the Pokemon series. So we don't usually look at the contents, but they actually made the contents a little interesting this time around for the 10th anniversary issue. You can see the two different Mario characters, where we started, where we're at. It's party time in Nintendo as we celebrate 10 years of bringing you the best... Nintendo game coverage around. This month, we're charting the changes we've seen in the game industry over the last decade. Technology may come and go, but the things that make games great remain the same. And I think that's true to this day. You see technology as far as things um, like Apex Legends and Fortnite and things of that nature. But every time Nintendo releases a good old Mario game, a good old Zelda game, they sell like crazy. And anytime the Pokemon company releases the Pokemon game, the formula is always the same, yet we get fantastic games. Coming down here, Warzone, uh, we see the late great Owen Hart jumping off the top there. This is a pre Preview for WWF Warzone on the Nintendo 64. Absolutely terrible game looking back on it. However, at the time, we were blown away at the theme songs, the graphics, the cages, the amount of attitude that would be in that game. Banjo Kazooie Part 2 in Mission Impossible 64. So, this section here, Players Pulse, is where people can send in their artwork on envelopes. We talked about that in the Wizard episode of Let's Read Number One. A lot of magazines would do this as a way to get people to send in, and when people send in, they usually have some kind of a comment or a question or a gripe, and then they take those questions and gripes and they turn them into news articles. One of the things I wanted to point out in this Player's Pulse is the first part up here. This says, the coolest teacher in the entire world. I am a 27-year-old teacher of a fourth grade class in Maine. Every Friday, I bring in a TV, my Super NES, and Final Fantasy III. My class and I started our adventure about two months ago, and we can hardly stop. I find that your games encourage reading skills as well as strategy development. I also let my class predict what will happen next. I can't wait until Zelda 64 comes out for next year's class. Now, he sent this via the internet, and the internet was so in its infantry at the time that it even says via the internet. Nintendo would respond, and to think our teacher's idea of educational fun was subjecting students to minor head injuries via an evil little game called Dodgeball. Very cool. Some awesome artwork. I would have loved to have had a teacher like that when I was in school. Play some Final Fantasy III on Fridays? Here we have the Nintendo 64 Top 10 Games. Right now, number one is GoldenEye, number two, Diddy Con Racing, number three, Yoshi's Story, followed up by 1080 Snowboarding, Star Fox 64, Super Mario 64, WCW vs. NWO World Tour, Mario Kart 64, Bomberman 64, Rampage World Tour. Now, for those of you that don't know, the reason a lot of these titles have the 64 after them is that this was still the time period when bits mattered. You had the NES that was 8-bit, the Sega Genesis that was 16-bit, the Mega Drive. We had the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn that were 32-bit. And then you had the Nintendo 64. This was so revolutionary. 64 bits, 32 bits. 16 bits, 8 bits, 4 bits, 2 bits, 1 bit, <laughs> 
that it was even codenamed Project 64. So this is a genius marketing campaign from all of these gaming companies, most of them being Nintendo first party, and that they'll just put 64 in the title. So you know when you look at that versus a Sony PlayStation game, you're going to get double the graphical integrity. Super Nintendo Top 10, number one, Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past, my absolute favorite Nintendo, uh, Super Nintendo game. Number two, Super Mario RPG. Number three, Donkey Kong Country 3, followed up by Final Fantasy 3, Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Country 2, Chrono Trigger, Harvest Moon, Super Mario Kart, and Final Fantasy 2. Some amazing, amazing games. All of these could be considered top 10 of all time on the Super Nintendo. And last but not least, let's go to the Game Boy Top 5. Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening, amazing game. James Bond 007, Donkey Kong Land 3, followed by Super Mario Land 2, Donkey Kong Land 2, and that's it. Cover story, WWF Warzone, you see Stone Cold Steve Austin. This game was made by Acclaim. WWF Warzone is ready to hit the ring, and Acclaim is calling you out to challenge their biggest wrestling title yet. This game was revolutionary. It had... Welcome to the World Wrestling Federation. For over 50 years, the dominating force in professional wrestling. I'm Vince McMahon. And I'm good old JR. What a matchup this will be. Rocky's change of attitude may do him some good in the WWF. Love him or hate him, he has all the tools to make it all the way in this business. Steve Austin is the toughest SOP in the WWF. Look at that ice cold stare in Austin's eye. Victory. It featured training, challenge, cages, Royal Rumble, versus mode as far as two players, tag team, one and four players, weapons match, gauntlet match, and war match. You can see Gold Dust, Dustin Rhodes up here. He's currently in AEW. Stone Cold Steve Austin battling Shawn Michaels here. Stone Cold Steve Austin, one of the greatest of all time. From behind, from behind you can get him in the Cobra. What they mean by Cobra, that's actually the million dollar dream. Uh, we have Shawn Michaels, the British Bulldog, rest in peace. Owen Hart, rest in peace. Brett the Hitman Hart. Brett was already almost a year removed from WCW, or I'm sorry, WWF, when this game came out. I actually don't even remember Bret Hart being in the game, so that might have changed at the last minute. But uh, he had left in November of 1997 in the inf infamous Montreal Screwjob. Mankind, Ahmed Johnson, Rocky Maivia, who would have known this would be the absolute most popular of all these athletes. Again, like earlier, I mentioned Gold Dust, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, today known as Triple H, The Undertaker, Ken Shamrock, and Kane. Thrasher and Mosh, the Headbangers, I absolutely don't remember them being in the game either. Um, if you do, leave a comment below. I do not recall them. Wow. 
There's some hidden wrestlers Dude Love. I wonder if he's related to One Love and Cactus Jack. They were just basically skins for the Mankind character. You have a create a wrestler, load and save using a memory card that you would plug into the back of your Nintendo 64 controller. Now we have Banjo-Kazooie. And one of the things that I did not mention already that I've loved about Nintendo Power from the start until the end is they always gave you a lot of colors in their reviews, in their strategies, and anything they did in their books. There's a lot of color. There's a lot of design. You could easily, uh, on a newsstand or in a supermarket or wherever you'd purchase your books, just flip it open and boom, you find this page in 1998, you're going to buy it. I'm not going to go through all of the strategy. I will pause so you can see some of these pages if you want to pause the screen in case any of this interests you. Really going in depth with Banjo Kazooie. Here we have, again, look at this artwork. This is incredible. F Zero X, Mark of Zero. They have the Zero One. F01, F0X, the stories of the extreme machines, the stories of the characters, this amazing original artwork over here on the left. I understand that it's a first party game from Nintendo, so they're going to put all their time and energy into their games. But this is just phenomenal. You had the real life wrestling photos of Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H and Shawn Michaels Undertaker in the first big article. And then you had the amazing artwork for Banjo Kazooie and now F0X. Fantastic. Great game, real colorful, very comic book looking. Comic books were on the downfall at the time, but that still a appealed to a lot of people. And here we have Mortal Kombat 4. Anytime Mortal Kombat is put into a magazine, at least as of back then, you're going to get a lot of hits on that. Mortal Kombat, always popular, still to this day, probably the absolute biggest it ever has been. This was a 3D Mortal Kombat. Going over the characters, you have Johnny Cage, Fujin, Jarek. Good old Jockstrap Jarek, Jax, Kai, Liu Kang, Quan Chi, Raiden, Rico, Reptile in a horrible design, Scorpion, Shinnok, Sonya, Sub-Zero, Tanya, and that's it for that. Now we have classified information. Classified information is basically just some tiny little quick hints, quick codes, Star Wars Shadows of the Empire debugging the empire uh, let's see so you can actually boot the game in debug mode you can walk wall ghost allows you to walk through walls and in invincibility well you know kobe bryant and nba courtside hidden special teams arrow gauge you can change the color 1080 awesome snowboarding game trick list cheat NHL 98 breakaway secret options menu. There's some cheats hidden in there. Top Gear Rally, a nine car garage. Quake, you can get into the debug menu. Enemies won't attack what they can't see. So basically you can just make yourself invisible and plow through the entire game. Olympic Hockey 98, you can morph players so they can have big heads, little feet. GoldenEye 007, floating remote mines. You know, as much as we played that game back then, um, and still now, every once in a while, I never actually heard of that code. Or remember it, I should say. MK Mythology Sub-Zero. This game was an absolute failure as far as the Mortal Kombat franchise because it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. It was a story game, action-adventure, uh, side-scrolling, that used the mechanics and the fighting mechanics of Mortal Kombat. So basically, if you can see this screenshot here, You'd scroll to the left or right of a screen and still have the graphics of a regular Mortal Kombat game. You'd beat the guy up, be able to hit your fatalities, and then move on to the next guy and so forth. Similar to uh, another game that Acclaim and Midway made, uh, Batman Forever, I believe it was, was the same way on the PlayStation and Saturn, maybe. But the game is fantastic. It had an awesome story. It had actual uh, real-life cutscenes that introduced Quan Chi and Shinnok into the Mortal Kombat universe.
you will fail. <laughs> The map is mine, Tokyo. Spare me. Fatality. Robotron, you get 110 extra lives. Clay Fighter, Sculptor's Cut. Uh, uh, you can get Earthworm Jim, it looks like. That's pretty cool. Classified information, with just some more things about the game. You can write in if you'd like. Chopper Attack, a game I have no interest in. But you get, again, a nice spread. Some colors in the background. You get the dog tags up here. If you're into these games, it's immediately going to suck you in. Four-page spread on that. Wow, six-page spread. Harvest Moon. If any of you play games nowadays, this probably sounds ultra familiar back then harvest moon for game boy had just come out here in the united states and it wasn't anything big it would do well and sell well but it's not like today where when people say harvest moon boom you get sales like that farm fresh fun i actually never played harvest moon on the game boy but again it's renowned and loved by players and critics alike it seems we may be getting to a poster of sorts a lot of harvest moon footage all right so our poster our mission impossible uh, this game got a lot of hype because of golden eye 007 everyone assumed it would be very similar and graphically it looks similar, but it's not first person and nowhere near as fun. Just giving you some hints and tips. Look at this. It really, uh, they spent a lot of time on this one. Mike Piazza Strike Zone. Who remembers Mike Piazza from Nintendo 64 Sports? There's a single game play mode, a World Series play mode, all-star game play mode, home run derby. You have seasons, team control. This game sounds like it would be phenomenal. I remember playing it and just not being impressed, though. GT Interactive steps up to the plate with the third Nintendo 64 baseball game of the season. You decide if it's a hit or miss. I decided back then that it was a miss. I did not like the way it controlled, and it just felt unfinished. 
Over here, you can see so many games. What's the difference? You had All Star Baseball '99, Minor League Baseball featuring, or I'm sorry, Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr. and Mike Piazza Strike Zone. I would assume Mike Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr. is going to get the best ratings. Let's see what they say. Griffey's play control is top-notch, the best of the three games. This title's bright graphics may not have the same dramatic shadow FX of All-Star Baseball 99, but this is a niggling detail that most gamers were willing to sacrifice for pinpoint hitting and fielding. If there's something missing from the game, it's the ability to create custom players for your favorite team's lineup. I don't care about creating custom players for a sports game. As far as sports game, I would buy them back then to play as my favorite players. I did not want to create myself in a sports game back then. I wanted to play as Ken Griffey Jr., as the Big Hurt, as a barrage of these other players. Quest 64. I've actually never played this game. Everybody loves it. It's, you know, the RPG on Nintendo 64. I understand that. The three kingdoms of Seltland have been at peace for a thousand years, but the theft of the Eltel book threatens to update the delicate balance of power. A lone sorcerer's apprentice must recover the book before its magic is abused, before the day of grief dawns and the world plunges into war. Giving you maps of each area, very helpful indeed. Telling you about each character you may encounter and what you would need to beat and defeat each one. Interesting outfit on her. They're really going in detail here. Now we have Counselor's Corner. The Legend of the Mythical Ninja Storing Goman. What's the trick to opening the Yamato Shrine? Quake 64. What's the best way to find every secret area? Which weapon do I use on Scython? Where is the secret exit in Necropolis? Quake 64 was ahead of its time. Fantastic game. Turok Dinosaur Hunter, actually another great game, and it's from an absolutely failed comic book series, despite the fact that Turok number one, when it came out, was the highest selling Valiant Comics comic book. Final Fantasy Legend 2 for Game Boy. A little uh, tidbit, if you did not know, the Final Fantasy Legend Game Boy games were not actually even Final Fantasy games in Japan. Um, they were completely separate RPGs, but were renamed Final Fantasy Legend due to the fact that by the time they were coming out, Final Fantasy had finally caught on in the North American region. Here we get to Nintendo Power's 10-year anniversary. I'll read the blurb up top. Ten years ago this month, Nintendo Power arrived in North America homes for the first time. It got us thinking, time flies and all of that. Here we've been playing games while nations have fallen. The World Wide Web was born. A sheep was cloned. We decided to reconstruct those years as a service to anyone, like us, who missed the big events because they were busy playing Super Metroid, and to put the video game world in perspective as we begin the second Nintendo Power decade. This looks to be a very fun section indeed. We start here in this timeline, July of 1998, in a year when Don't Worry, Be Happy is in heavy rotation on the radio, Nintendo Power debuts as a bi-monthly magazine. Gracing the first cover is Mario, and inside are strategies for The Legend of Zelda and Double Dragon, the Howard and Nestor comic strip, a baseball poster, and a profile of Kirk Growing Pains Cameron. What an issue this is. I actually do not have the original issue of Nintendo Power. And the final issue of Nintendo Power, which obviously we won't see here yet in 1998, that came out in 2012, was a very cool tribute and uh, remake of this original cover. August 88, Nintendo releases world-class track meet with the power pad. September 88, Nintendo makes its first foray into television with the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, starring the World Wrestling Federation's Captain Lou Albano as Mario. This topic deserves an entire episode in itself, so I won't get too far into it, but oh my god, what a show. 
um, in both bad ways and good ways and bad good ways. December of 88, Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link continues the Hillian's journeys, this time with both overhead and side-scrolling views. The total number of Nintendo Entertainment Systems sold reaches 7 million. That is incredible, especially for back then. February 89, the horror, LGN begins making games based on slasher fix, God help us all. Friday the 13th is a first with a nightmare on Elm Street to follow, an idea that turns out to be scarier than the games themselves. Both of those games are horrible. People try to justify them nowadays and say that you just didn't understand the playing mechanics, and that may have been true back then. If you don't understand a game's playing mechanics, then the game has failed already because it didn't show you how to use the mechanics. Aside from that, the games suck. May of 89, NBC airs the final episode of Family Ties and debuts the pilot of Seinfeld. These pretzels, Nintendo Power is making me thirsty, so you know what happens when we get thirsty here on Zack the Ripper Comics. We reach down, we grab into the bag, we put into the frame, polar, We pound that bad boy. We do a little ASMR. A little ASM ripper. A little polar seltzer in that ass. June of 89, federal regulations require all toy guns to look like toy guns. As a result, the NES Zapper light gun is redone in a hinding hue of orange rather than its former shade of gray. I was fortunate enough to have the gray one, but I will tell you, even as a child, I never once thought that the Nintendo Zapper was a real gun. I did not even call it a gun. I called it a Zapper. <laughs> August 89, here's some huge news, Tetris on the cover. Nintendo releases Game Boy, the world's most popular portable gaming system, along with Tetris, the first Game Boy game, which would go on to become the most popular uh. puzzle video game ever. Nintendo also releases its very first role-playing game, Dragon Warrior. Nintendo breaks gaming's tough guy stereotype by introducing Metroid, a game in which players discover in the finale that the hero beneath the armored spacesuit is a woman. A lot to unpack here. I hope we have that issue in a future Let's Read. However, let's just say the Game Boy is gigantic, was gigantic. A very interesting thing surrounding Dragon Warrior is that if you were a Nintendo Power subscriber, you got Dragon Warrior for free. And if you're not familiar with what Dragon Warrior is, it's nowadays referred to in North America as Dragon Quest. In Japan, from its inception, it was always Dragon Quest. An amazing, amazing RPG series. And then to top that all off, all in the same month, they introduce Metroid to us. And if you were able to get through the game, which I was not as a kid, it was tons and tons of rumors on the playground that uh, what we called Metroid, he, the main character is not named Metroid, her name is Samus, but we just assumed as children that the main character's name was Metroid, that it was a female, and it blew our minds, and we never got to see it, at least I never got to see it personally, until this time with the internet and some websites were able to put up uh, screen grabs and, you know, early videos that were downloadable, and my mind was blown, even as a teenager when I discovered that. November 89, the hits keep coming. Audiences catch their first glimpse of Super Mario Bros. 3 in the video game road movie The Wizard, starring Fred Wonder Years Savage. Awesome movie. Awesome video game. Fred Savage, eh, he's not awesome. But it's worth checking out. The Wizard, featuring the first ever appearance of Super Mario Bros. 3.
I love the power glove. It's so bad. January of 1990, Double Dragon 2 The Revenge debuts. Along with other fighting games like Street Fighter, Double Dragon makes a big impact on gaming by ushering in the fighting trend, which would be at its strongest during much of the early 90s. I personally had uh, Double Dragon 2, and I absolutely loved it. A friend of mine, Rod Gorley, had Double Dragon 1, and although the game's amazing, it's uh, not multiplayer as far as co-op you can do the versus mode but you can't play together they fixed that with double dragon 2 amazing game february 1990 how can you stop nintendo here nintendo releases the biggest video game yet super mario brothers 3 which would go on to sell well over 14 million copies mike tyson loses his boxing heavyweight title after getting punched out by james Buster Douglas has a huge impact um, on the Sega Genesis market, and I'm sure we'll get into that one day. May of 1990, just as the street fighting trend begins to take off, RPGs find a following. Leading the trend is Final Fantasy, yet the very first one for the NES, perhaps the king of all RPGs. August of 1991, Nintendo doubles its power by releasing the Super NES with 16 bits of gameplay power, comparison to the Nintendo's 8 bits. Yoshi is also born this month, debuting in Super Mario World, F-Zero, Pilot Wings, and SimCity are among the other premier titles for the new system. It just feels like month after month, uh, Nintendo was releasing these amazing games that we look back as legendary and groundbreaking and it was just the norm month after month after month after month starting in 1988 and here up to 1991. September 91, Washington State becomes known for something other than Nintendo and Microsoft when Nirvana releases its second album, Nevermind. Nirvana single-handedly destroyed the heavy metal hairband market of the 1980s. They ushered in grunge rock, and only a few years later, after Kurt Cobain killed himself, the era of grunge would subside in the more favorable, family-friendly, alternative music. Still, this was huge, and it's funny that in 1998, Nintendo would even mention Microsoft, for as three years from now, Microsoft would debut the Xbox and thus begin a war with Nintendo and Sony. December 1991, one of the best Nintendo Power Covers original artwork, Konami leads off its slew of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games with TMNT 2 back from the sewers for Game Boy. All of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games on Game Boys are must-play. If you have a Game Boy and you have not yet played any of the TMNT games, please get them. Um, back from the sewers and Fall of the Foot Clan, amazing games. April 92, Nintendo releases The Le Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, one of the most popular games for the Super Nintendo, and in my opinion, the best game on the Super Nintendo. July of 1992, Wave Race humbly begins as a Game Boy game. And they say humbly because at this point in 1998, Wave Race 64 was a huge franchise for Nintendo. And it would finally disappear around the Wii era. That's something that I feel like they should really bring back on the Switch is the Wave Race games, the 1080 games, and things like that. August of 1992, a marshmallow fellow named Kirby debuts in Kirby Dreamland for Game Boy. So, <laughs> just from 88 to 92, we've gotten the beginning of Metroid. We have the NES Zapper. We have Tetris. We have Game Boy. We have Dragon Warrior, Final Fantasy, uh, Legend of Zelda 2, A Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, Super Mario World, Super Nintendo, Battletoads. Like, it just doesn't stop. And here, we get to the debut of of Kirby. October 1992, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! is re-released as Punch-Out! featuring Mr. Dream. I never actually got to play the uh, Mike Tyson version. Uh, the reason they changed it is because he went through a court battle um, regarding things that I won't talk about on this show. You can go look it up yourselves. He ended up serving jail time, and because of that, Nintendo wanted to distance themselves. Completely understandable. And they re-released the game as Punch-Out! featuring Mr. Dream. And that was the Punch-Out! that I played as a kid. Um, got to Mr. Dream, but was never able to defeat him. 
March of 1993, another awesome, amazing original artwork cover. Landing on our galaxy in March, Star Fox is the first game to use the FX chip, which enables texture mapping and improved sprite and polygon animation. The FX chip would merely hint at what the N64 would be capable of three years later. Star Fox is a renowned series for Nintendo. And when it came out on Super Nintendo, personally, I saw the graphical integrity of the game and saw that this was somehow harnessing power in the Super Nintendo that I had not thought possible. However, it did not appeal to me. Now, Star Fox on the N64 did, and I played the ever-living crap out of that game. It was one of the games that I got for Christmas from Santa Claus for my Nintendo 64, and absolutely loved it. This is something that I'm sure everybody wishes we could take back. May of 1993, the bros hit the big screen when Super Mario Bros. movie starring Bob, who framed Roger Rabbit, Hoskins, opens nationwide. One of the worst, not just video game movies of all time, but one of the worst movies of all time, period. However, I personally have a soft spot in my heart for the game in a nostalgia sense. August of 1993, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening for Game Boy debuts in that same month. A dream of a game, the adventure becomes a real eye-opener for gamers with its gigantic levels, intriguing story, and lasting appeal. Mortal Kombat bullies its way to the Super NES and introduces the fatality move to fighting games. And the X-Files opens on TV. The reason it says Mortal Kombat bullies its way to the Super NES is that Nintendo did not want the blood-ridden Mortal Kombat on their system systems in any way whatsoever. They fought Mortal Kombat 1 tooth and nail on that system and they even made a claim or midway whoever it was at the time producing Mortal Kombat. They made them remove the blood from the game so that it looks like sweat or in my opinion it looks like concrete flying out of the body. In Mortal Kombat 2 it would release the same way however they had loosened up a little bit and allowed you to put in a code if you were able to get it therefore them thinking hey only the adults will be able to get the codes. You put in the code and you can access blood in the game. May of 1994 Nintendo Power Source goes online with Nintendo.com. June of 1994, Super Game Boy flies onto the scene, allowing gamers to plug their Game Boy games into a Super NES. I never had one of those growing up, but they were very cool. If you had a Super Nintendo and you had Game Boy games, you could play your Game Boy games on your regular television utilizing the Super Game Boy, and it would even give you enhanced visuals and colors sometimes. August of 1994, DC Comics puts a new spin on the story of Superman and faster than a speeding bullet, the Super NES is a rare is there to catch it in the game, The Death and Return of Superman. That's not a bad game. The story itself from DC Comics is one of the most legendary of all time. I recommend anybody checking out The Death of Superman. However, The Return, eh, not so much. June 1995. Forget about Majestic Castles and Dewey Meadows, Nintendo introduces the modern-day RPG Earthbound. The Super NES merges onto the Information Superhighway via Catapult's X-Band, a modem that allows players to play other X-Banders online. So the first portion of that, regarding Earthbound, this game was an absolute failure. It launched in an oversized box and even came with its own strategy guide. I can remember this being in a $5 bin at KB Toys because nobody wanted it because North America still, regardless of the success of uh, Dragon Warrior and the success of Final Fantasy, wasn't crazy on board with RPGs. They look back and they say that this is, you know... Uh, quirky and things of that nature and it's beloved now and there's multiple sequels and everybody loves Earthbound but back then nobody wanted it, nobody played it, nobody bought it. And then to end that, in 1995 people were able to go online and play other players. I didn't know about this back then nor would I have been able to even fathom going online and playing with other people. August 1995, with virtual reality being all the rage, Nintendo introduces Virtual Boy, oh boy, by looking into dual lens of its headset, viewers would be immersed in their game's 3D imagery and the Mortal Kombat movie premieres. That's funny timing as the newest Mortal Kombat reboot movie is about to premiere on HBO Max. 
Now, the Virtual Boy. Something that we will probably cover in depth at some point. The Virtual Boy was an absolute failure. My friend Tony Ushak had a Virtual Boy, and within about, honestly, 30 seconds of playing it, we would have horrible, horrible headaches each time. His brother, one of my patrons, Joey Ushak, would play it also, and he can attest to that. They only were able to use red and black as the colors, and it just did a number on your eyeballs. I do not recommend ever using a Virtual Boy. However, if you're looking to complete a video game collection, it's pretty cool to have. It came from the third dimension with its own brain, its own voice, its own legs. There's only one problem. It needs your eyes. Virtual Boy. See it now in 3D. September of 95, Doomsday arrives as ID Software delivers Doom, its 3D shooter for the PC to the Super NES. Huge news, that game had a red cartridge, very cool. Earthworm Jim becomes so popular, he enters his own cartoon series which would last for two seasons. October 1995, Mario reverts to infanthood as Yoshi schlumps him around in Yoshi's Island Super Mario Land, or Super Mario World, excuse me, too. Fantastic game. Everybody bitches and moans over the fact that Mario would cry when he, you know, got hit off of Yoshi. It never bothered me as a kid. I, I think people are just overreactionary when it comes to that. November 1995, MGM releases its 17th Bond flick, GoldenEye 007, the first to star Pierce Brosnan as Bond, James Bond. And that would, of course, spawn the amazing 1997 game GoldenEye 007 on the N64. September 1996, Nintendo releases Super Mario 64, Pilot Wing 64, Wave Race 64, and Drumroll, the Nintendo 64, a 64-bit dream machine able to create fully interactive 3D environments. April 1997, multicolored Game Boy Pockets brighten our world. The Tamagotchi craze hits America's shores. The virtual pet that requires perpetual care. Oof. From their owners become so phenomenally distracting that Tamagotchi begins to cause fender benders and other unfortunate mishaps. Bad Tamagotchi. Bad. Acclaims Turok Dinosaur Hunter enters the hallowed halls of the Nintendo 64 to become the system's first first-person shooter. We talked about that game. We talked about that game earlier. June of 1997, the Rumble Pack, a force feedback controller accessory that vibrates in reaction to events in your game, rocks the gaming world in the Lilac Galaxy with its debut in Star Fox 64. Another cool thing that I just forgot, or just remembered, that when you bought Star Fox, you would get the Rumble Pack with it. Now, the whole game was around, I think, $89.99, which back then video games were running around $39 or $49, so you were paying for it, obviously, but it was nice that it came as a two-pack. August of 1997, two years after the Bond movie premiered, James Bond returns in GoldenEye 007, but this time it's an N64 video game version that would help redefine the 3D shooting genre. GoldenEye will go on to win the first ever Academy of Interactive Arts and Scientists Game of the Year award. Amazing. October 1997. On October 4th, Gunpei Yokoi, a visionary and pioneer for Nintendo in the entire video game industry, passes away. Mr. Yokoi was an inventor and toy maker who made inroads into the gaming industry by designing the Game & Watch, which were just released as collectibles recently, and I did get one from some very close friends of mine, and we did an unboxing of that. He created the Game Boy and Game Boy Pocket. One of the big attention getters of 97 begs for gamers' attention. Constant attention. Like feed me, praise me, guess in which direction I'll smile, Tamagotchi hatches on Game Boy. The Super Nintendo gets a makeover to sport a sleeker look. 
May of 1998, the final episode of Seinfeld airs. So we literally got to see, through this little timeline look back, uh, the debut of Seinfeld, and now the final episode in May of 1998. And here we are, July of 98, Nintendo Power celebrates its 10th anniversary. So there you have it, 10 years of power in one hand, and 10 years of cultural and world events on the other. Of course, what really matters is that you're having fun and we're getting paid to play games. Let's go for 10 more. They would go for 10 more. 10, 10, 10, a bunch of uh, giveaways over here. We have a player's poll. Fill this bad boy out and you could win some of these prizes. What do you have? Grand prize. Choose 10 games from the covers of Nintendo Power. Let's see. 1080 Snowboarding, Super Mario Kart, Donkey Kong Country. That's Diddy Kong. Can't tell what that is, though. Metroid, Banjo-Kazooie, Ken Griffey Baseball, Super Mario Brothers 3, 007, NBA Courtside. Second prize. Choose one game from the covers. And third prize, cool Nintendo Power t-shirts. I would love to have that. Looks like Link. If you have uh, this t-shirt, leave a comment below. And send it to me. Here we are. Some more original art. Some more colorful art. Bust a Move 2, the arcade edition. This was for Nintendo 64. Um, something like this probably would either release in uh, digital form only nowadays or strictly on a mobile market because it was just a little bit it was just a puzzle game but what a great puzzle game it was uh, you wouldn't have any of the ones you have today on your cell phone if not for um, bust a move which was inspired by bubble bobble and they're just giving you some tips and tricks all-star baseball 99 Acclaims All-Star Baseball 99 looks and plays much the same as Frank Thomas's Big Hurt Baseball, but we don't mind at all. In fact, it means you get a lot of batting and pitching options, some good fielding control, and six play modes crammed into just two megs of memory. All that, and you can take it with you, too. So this was a Game Boy game that you could play on the go, and then, of course, you could hook it into your Super Game Boy and play it on television with some colors added. Uh, no thanks, as far as a sports game on the Game Boy. Arena Are You Game, the challenge, bearing it all. So these are some challenges for Banjo-Kazooie, 1080 Snowboarding, Ken Griffey Jr. Scoreboard, you could send in your scores for Star Fox, Diddy Kong, San Francisco Rush, Wheel of Fortune. That's some horrible 1998 word art. Now playing your power guide to the latest releases for Game Boy, Nintendo 64, and Super Nintendo. So this is just a preview along with their review score for upcoming games. So we start off with Mission Impossible. They gave it an overall 7.2. Um, assuming this is out of 10. If so, I would say that's a little high. The game's not garbage, but it's just not as good as it could have been. Chopper Attack, they give a 6.6. .6. Mortal Kombat 4, they score 7.5. I honestly think this should go higher. Uh, a lot of people were dissatisfied with the 3D mechanics back then, but when you look back, it's absolutely um, legendary, and it's a fantastic game. Quest 64 got a 6.3. Again, that should be higher in my opinion. Mike Piazza's Strike Zone got a 5.4, and I guess that's okay. Bust and Move 2, 6.5. Um, this tells you who's scoring these games, yeah, and how they're scoring them. Pack Watch. So in the 1980s, Nintendo tried very hard to call their video games video packs. And that was because the downfall in 1982 of video games, the implosion because of Atari and their nonsense, they didn't want to associate with video games. That's why the Nintendo was called the Nintendo Entertainment System. They wanted to make it feel that it was not just video games, it was a bunch of things. And it came with a robot toy and so forth. So just for the sake of tradition, they still call it Pack Watch. Basically what Packwatch is, it's their article that just talks about upcoming games. They don't necessarily rate them, but they're telling you if you should be looking out for these, and uh, if so, why. So they're going to be taking a look at Turok 2, 12 Tales, ODT, College Hoops 99. Here we have Rogue Squadron, 12 Tales, Perfect Dark, Jet Force Gemini, Perfect Dark. 
The game that everybody's been wanting a remake of uh, since it came out. <laughs> Legendary video footage. It's a screenshot here from E3 1998 in Atlanta. They showed off Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Everybody flipped out that was able to see that. Uh, what else? Turok 2, Blitz, amazing game. Madden, Castlevania. They're telling you to look out for Penny Racers and Roadster 98. I don't remember either one of those games with a little Pokemon ad down here because Pokemon was gigantic. Pack Peaks. This is upcoming games that they might have gotten a little preview at E3. Uh, it feels like they have about three different features in this magazine that are all around the same thing. I understand that. I'm sure you guys are thinking that. But they had to fill it somehow. And here we see the preview of an upcoming StarCraft game. Um, StarCraft is still around to this day, so that's pretty cool. Coming next issue, in August of 98, issue number 111, they're going to be covering Bomberman Hero. Bomberman's back in Bomberman Hero, his first adventure game for the Nintendo 64. Next month, we'll cover the explosive news, moves, cool gizmos, and incredible rides like the Bomber Jet and Bomber Marine. Get the complete intel report on Bomberman's new nemesis, the Evil Empire, prepared to be blown away. Also, they'll be looking at F1 World Grand Prix. Uh, I don't know how to say that. YLA Country Cub. And Turok 2, Seeds of Evil. And then they list every game down the bottom here. As well as upcoming games for your Nintendo 64 back issues. They list back issues if you'd like to order some of those. And then lastly over here, we have some awesome new Yoshi gear. Uh, let's see. We have a Yoshi Story Shape CD. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Yoshi dog tags, Yoshi t-shirt, Yoshi college sweatshirt, Yoshi youth ringer. I would love that shirt. That's pretty cool. I like ringer shirts. Yoshi watch, collectible Yoshi set, power supplies, note to self, order cool Yoshi stuff for friends and family. Yoshi message center, $5. And what is on the back cover but an ad for... The Game Boy Camera. Now, if you did not notice, there were no ads in this magazine, and that was one of Nintendo's things that they've always done. If they were showing off something like, in the very beginning, this ad, quote-unquote, here, it was for a first-party game, their game, and it was also tying into renewing your membership with Nintendo Power. Nintendo did not sell ads in their magazines, and that's what made it uh, very enticing because uh, you wouldn't have like a game pro where there's you know a couple hundred pages and maybe only 50 pages of actual content you would actually get a load of content with your nintendo powers i hope you guys enjoyed this let's read leave a comment below letting me know what you thought of this video uh what you think of the series in general what you think of this particular issue of nintendo power did you have a nintendo 64 do you still have it what was your favorite game on there any anything you'd like leave that comment below Please hit that bell for notifications so you know when I go live and when we upload videos like this. We are just days away from March 2021, which means spring is on its way. And if you're looking for the absolute best t-shirt to rock, it's not going to be the rock shirt. It's not going to be your favorite sports jersey. It's going to be the official Zack the Ripper comics t-shirt. You can find this actual shirt along with a barrage of over 50 plus items at the Zack the Ripper Comics Teespring store. The link is in the description below. If you go on there, if you purchase one of my items, let me know, send me a direct message on any of my social media and I will feature that in an upcoming video. If you'd like to be in one of my videos, please go purchase one of the shirts, one of the anythings, there's leggings, all kinds of cool stuff on there and I will put you in a video. One last time, check it out, the official Zack the Ripper Comics t-shirt, nice and bright, cutting its way, ripping its way into your hands. Professional wrestler Zack the Ripper Comics can attest to a lot of things. What it takes to make it in the professional wrestling world. What it takes when it comes to bodybuilding and training and focusing on your body. And what it takes when it comes to ingesting the ultimate beverage. And in this case, as you know, the ultimate beverage is Polar Seltzer. It's a little dark there as you can see. 
but that doesn't stop us when it comes to Puller because if you want to be a champion, if you want to pose with the belt, if you want to hashtag pose with the belt, then what you have to do is drink Puller. Oh, hell yeah. That's good stuff. That's the show, folks. I want to thank all of my patrons over at patreon.com slash Zach the Ripper Comics for supporting the channel. Not only are you getting exclusive content that you cannot see anywhere else but on patreon.com, but you're also getting some awesome merchandise courtesy of our Teespring store. Link in the description below. T-shirts, hoodies, fanny packs, dog sweaters, and even the ever-popular ladies' leggings. For everybody that liked us on Facebook, found us on Instagram, hit up the ebay.com slash Zach the Ripper comic store for all of your comic book needs. And last but not least, hit the thumbs up on this video, hit the bell for notifications so you know when we go live or when we post brand new content. And last but not least, subscribing to the channel as it goes a long, long way as we are on the road to 3,000 subscribers. Until next time. Now that, that's a hit. Polar. We're just gonna do one take of that. So without further ado, let's get into the let's read WCW with the reverse. September of 1995, Doomsday arrives as I, I blah, blah, blah. toy stores open their door. Oh. Blah, 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 Claims Turok Dinosaur Hunter The Super NES gets a makeover to sport a neater